I have this lecture series both to engage people in the winter time and also to build up a body of knowledge about local uh, history and architecture. Uh, so all these lectures are recorded and will be um, available on our, our website for future reference. Um, we are a volunteer-run organization, and we are looking for people to um, join our board. So if you have an interest in local history and preservation issues, uh, feel free to inquire with myself or Bob or other board members about getting involved with the organization. All right, uh, and now we will have uh, Pastor Russell introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Pastor B. Chavez Russell here at Greater Friendship uh, Missionary Baptist Church. And it is, I, we are uh, completing year two, you know, so I'm still a baby pastor. Uh, so, <laughs> but I, I tell you what, since I've been in the Twin Cities, uh, our speaker today has been someone that has really inspired me, uh, someone that's really uh, been uh, a, a beacon of wisdom. Uh, and, and knowledge, uh, not only in our church, uh, but in our community. So we thank you all for being here today. Thank you for hosting this event here. Um, and everybody that's online, we have it live online. Thank you for joining us, whether now or later. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate you. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I want to introduce to you our speaker for the day, uh, none other than Judge Lejeune Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Russell. It was appropriate that we gather today at Greater Friendship, one of the historic black Baptist churches. Uh, the church had a watch night service, and I think all of you who are historians know how important watch night was the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation in January of on the eve of January 1st of 1963, people gathered in homes and churches waiting for the clock to tick off and for the Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Abraham Lincoln to come into effect. The church has been, for the black church, the AME church, which is the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and the various uh, African Baptist churches and Free Will Baptist churches have been at the forefront of both historic preservation, civic engagement, and the rendering of services to uh, enslaved and formerly enslaved people. Because as you know, we did not have any form of community service or any kind of assistance to people who had been denied the ability to save money or own property and suddenly found themselves uh, free. So I'm getting a little ahead of the story. We want to start with a, a video that we researched and, and compiled, which is called Longfellow, Our Journey, which we're just going to show you a short portion to set the tone. Stopped right here. 
their ropes were tied around these very trees, leaving century-old scars in the wood. In the oral tradition of the Dakota people, it is said that the boat that brought Dred Scott to Minnesota well, the Longfellow neighborhood has a unique intersection of history. Our history is rarely we have the Fort, so Fort Snelling, which was the largest uh, place of enslavement in the Midwest. And we also have Dred Scott, who lived with his wife Harriet at Fort Snelling and ultimately went to St. Louis and sued for his freedom and the various efforts that uh, Dred Scott made to gain his freedom resulted in a U.S. Supreme Court decision, which the Supreme Court said a black man has no rights, that a white man is bound to respect. And so that was a prelude to our civil war in the United States, um, among many other factors that were going on at the time. We had the fugitive slave law. We had the abolition of slavery in Canada in 1834. We had the abolition of slavery in Great Britain in 1834. And so we were surrounded by forces of change at the end of the Mexican-American War, which also had a tone of slavery. There were states that were going to be admitted to the United States. And the debate was whether they were going to enter as free states or enter as uh, an ex opportunity to expand slavery. So slavery has been part of our national discussion since the founding of our country. The conflicts over slavery impacted our nation and right here in Minnesota, we have some direct on the ground uh, connections. So we look at Dred Scott and we look at the uh, area where Fort Snelling was, and we see that importance, and we also see that after Dred and Harriet Scott left, and we were looking closer to uh, actually getting involved in the Civil War, our Minnesota government uh, volunteered the first troops to serve. And so as a result of that, we uh, had uh, recognition shortly after statehood in terms of our dedication to the Union. But that wasn't the whole story. There were many people left in Minnesota trying to figure out what their status was going to be at the end of this war. There were families that were torn apart by the repeated drafts that occurred because the original estimation of the war was that it would only be a few months and miscalculations and other things by generals extended that war into a prolonged uh, conflict taking years. We had in May of 1863, after the second confiscation act, we had steamboats uh, chartered by the military to go down to St. Louis, Missouri and bring up uh, what we called contraband at the time, formerly enslaved people who wished to come north for a better opportunity. And the Second Confiscation Act allowed those people to not only be forever free, but also allowed them to be employed uh, by the US government. So they could be uh, teamsters, they could be undercooks, they could uh, join when the US colored troops were formed, they could join the military. And there was also a provision in the Second Confiscation Act that allowed a person who had the means to pay $300, they could pay for someone to take their place uh, in the draft. So we have a record in Minnesota at Fort Snelling of meeting our military quotas through both volunteers and through the use of substitutes. And so many times these substitutes connect with our research to the families that came up in May of 1863 from uh, Missouri, from the uh, contraband camps and who were uh, housed on the grounds of Fort Snelling. And so in May of 1863, you had 
uh, we'd call it Camp Misery. You had contraband camps on the grounds of Fort Snelling, and you had a concentration camp on the grounds of Fort Snelling where Native American people were confined. And so when the steamboats coming in May of 1863 brought the people who they thought, according to the recruiters, were going to be males, uh, they brought full families plus males because the people had been through enough and they weren't going to be just worked and separated from their families. So they came on these steamboats with their children and with their wives. And the military only had use for the males. So the wives and children in a segregated military base had no accommodations. So they were able to seek housing in what is called Richfield because the area around the fort uh, became Richfield and extended into uh, this neighborhood we call Longfellow. So that whole southern quadrant of the city was impacted by new arrivals and many of them lived either in the Richfield area or came a little further down uh, to uh, Snelling Avenue, which back then was still Richfield, because it wasn't until uh, the late, very late 1800s that Minneapolis annexed uh, Richfield uh, past uh, Lake Street. So we, we have a history in Minneapolis when we talk about our city that we don't include Richfield, so there's a whole big missing part of how we tell our narrative because we don't talk about how we annex this population and who lived where and what their contributions were. So our research with the International Leadership Institute has been to start with the historical narrative that has been well researched and then try to fill in the gaps to tell the full story. And we have done that effectively by locating descendants of some of these very, very early uh, African-American families who arrived in either uh, on the boats in 1863 or came before that, like the uh, Emily Gray and her husband who came in the 1850s. And so we've connected with their descendants and learned more of the story with regard to what was happening in Minnesota. So Ralph Gray was one of those people who came, an African descended person, he came in the 1850s and started a barber shop at the Jarrett House when Minnesota was a territory. His wife Emily joined him in 1857. They became part of the territorial pioneers and were very uh, active in terms of abolitionist efforts and uh, I think all of you have heard about their effort to free Eliza Winston, a woman who was enslaved by a visiting southern planter. But they had more activities than just Eliza Winston. Uh, Emily Gray's maiden name was Goodrich, and her father was a leader in the Underground Railroad in York, Pennsylvania. And he later came and lived with them in Minneapolis. Her father was a friend of Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass uh, later came to Minnesota and was hosted by them and included in as many uh, events as he could do at a time with limited transportation. But he was able to give an address in downtown Minneapolis at one of the newest uh, lecture halls and fill it completely when invited by the Grays. When we had the Civil War uh, going and we had men volunteering to serve in the colored troops, men take, risking their life to be a substitute for another Minnesotan who they had no connection to, the men uh, and the families of African descent felt that they were moving closer to full citizenship yet they did not have that in Minnesota. So what was necessary, since there was not uh, citizenship rights to 
African descendant people is that they had to file a petition statewide presented to the legislature for a constitutional amendment to allow uh, black men to be able to have the right to vote. And so that petition drive, presentation to the legislature, and a vote statewide took place three times in Minnesota before it was passed. And so that vote was finally passed by a majority of the white men in Minnesota because we know the women didn't have the right to vote in the 1860s. So the men voted and uh, a majority gave black men the right to vote. So black men celebrated. It was also the anniversary in 1868 of January 1 again of the Emancipation Proclamation. So they had what was called a Colored People's Convention in St. Paul to take stock of this important event of taking and gaining the right to vote and what that meant in terms of the responsibilities that also attached for civic improvement, education, and participation in civic life. So that uh, Colored People's Convention was a, a moment where Ralph Gray, again, who came from territorial days, read the Emancipation Proclamation in 1868 at this event in St. Paul. But we have not to the uh, history's uh, satisfaction recognize the importance of our role in Minnesota. Minnesota was not only the first to volunteer uh, soldiers, but we also had the last living Civil War soldier in Minnesota to die. And we have been working through the Institute to reach out to families who served in that important Civil War in, as part of the U.S. Colored Troops to make sure that their burial places are honored, that their graves are recognized, and that there are markers uh, on their graves. So we will uh, go to the next slide, and I will talk about the connection between Fort Snelling and that geographic area, Dred Scott, and a man who's on the minds of every uh, one in this state, and that's George Floyd. So George Floyd also was in that same quadrant just a few miles from where Dred Scott was at Fort Snelling. And of course, if you want the technical image of Fort Snelling in 1839, Fort Snelling was far, far larger than we regard it today. So if you look at the footprints of Dred Scott and the footprints of George Floyd, they logically could have intersected in that 38th and Chicago area because Fort Snelling was so large. And George uh, Floyd died on that ground that is historic, that enslaved people, that pioneer people, that Native American people had walked. And it's important that we, as we look at what to do with 38th Street in Chicago, that we recognize the importance to the nation and the world of uh, the consciousness and the important thoughtfulness that we should take as Minnesotans to recognize uh, what happened and how, like Dred Scott's efforts, also echoed around the world. And so we started intentionally with the Longfellow neighborhood and South Minneapolis to see how important that large area with the undertold story of slavery at Fort Snelling and the efforts by Dred and Harriet Scott living at Fort Snelling and the low-key way that Dred Scott and Harriet Scott's life at Fort Snelling has been portrayed uh, by uh, local history organizations and the fort. Uh, many people who've been to Fort Snelling have asked 
I've asked, have you, did you go to Dred Scott's residence? No. So you can do a tour and never uh, have that included as part of the tour. And if you don't know to ask, then you miss even though you've been to Fort Snelling on a number of occasions. So in, I believe it was 2012, we brought the great-great-granddaughter of Dred Scott, who has the Dred Scott Foundation in St. Louis, Missouri. We brought her up to Fort Snelling because we learned that she had never received an invitation and had not been to the fort. So the Minnesota Historical Society and the Fort Snelling uh, staff graciously welcomed her and uh, brought her into the Dred Scott residence. It was, you could hear a pin drop. It was just a moment that you can't describe. I was fortunate enough to be there when it happened and to see this connection of history for her to be able to see uh, the ground where her ancestors walked and to take in uh, that uh, brick uh, room was incredible. And so we, when we tell the full story, we impact more people, we make the experience richer, and we are more true to ourselves in terms of not skipping over uh, important parts of our history. And so we'll go to the next slide. I think we have uh, Corporal John Wesley Harper. And we have some descendants of uh, Corporal Harper uh, in the room today. And uh, we have Corporal Harper became Sergeant Harper with the, his service uh, later. So I'll start at the beginning of the story. And uh, Corporal Harper was living in Ohio when the call came that a U.S. Colored Troop Regiment was going to be formed after the law permitted uh, people of color to bear arms. And so this newly formed uh, fighting unit was called the Massachusetts 54th Volunteer Regiment. And from Zanesville, Ohio, John Wesley Harper was recruited to become part of that. One of the chief recruiters for the Massachusetts 54th was a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. And I think all of you know him. And Frederick Douglass also recruited his sons to serve in the Massachusetts 54th. So the Massachusetts 54th uh, saw brutal, horrific fighting. They lost uh, over 50% uh, of their men through combat, but uh, John Wesley Harper was one of those who was able to survive. So their leader, Colonel Shaw, died in battle and after many years of debate and struggle, the people of Massachusetts had the opportunity to erect a statue in the honor of Colonel Shaw. But they also knew that Colonel Shaw would not be Colonel Shaw without the courageous black men under his leadership. So the uh, sculptor was uh, directed to put in the black soldiers uh, next to Colonel Shaw. And the honor to the men of the Massachusetts 54th was that the surviving men of the 54th at the dedication of the statute were invited to march in uniform uh, down the streets of Boston when the statute was installed. So uh, Corporal Harper was able to come and march in uniform uh, during that ceremony when the statute was installed. He maintained his Civil War uniform. He had moved to Minnesota in the early 1800s as part of the 25th U.S. Infantry and was stationed at Fort Snelling. And since Fort Snelling was a segregated military base and it was segregated from the day it opened to the day it closed, they built uh, temporary wooden barracks 
for the colored soldiers, and the colored soldiers stayed in those temporary wooden barracks at Fort Snelling. So Mr. Uh, Harper was able to uh, raise a family of 16 children in Minnesota, and so when you have 16 children, you have a number of cousins and second cousins and third cousins, so uh, some of the family members are here. Uh, Tanae and, and her mom are descendants of Colonel Harper, and we also recognize him as Sergeant Harper. But our efforts with Harry Davis, who was carrying the memory of uh, Corporal Harper or slash Sergeant Harper at his death, wanted uh, his uh, descendant, his ancestor to be recognized. And he came to the International Leadership Institute uh, asking that this uh, undertold story be given uh, full recognition. We went to uh, Fox 9 News, asked them to uh, talk about our research and assist us in getting a marker for his grave. He was buried at the Crystal Lake Cemetery without the uh, U.S. Colored Troops marker. And so through the efforts of the family and the publicity, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense has agreed to provide the U.S. Colored Troops replica marker and this spring, given a date decided by the family, they will install the marker at his family plot at Crystal Lake. And there's many more uh, families who have loved ones who were not given markers for their graves, so we're going bit by bit to work with those families to make sure that they get uh, the honor and recognition that uh, they uh, desire and are entitled to. We have a ongoing effort to involve descendants in our research because it is their story. It's not just us who are writing and researching through uh, files and records, it's the life and bloodline of real people. So we feel the uh, inclusion of the descendant is very, very important. We have researched uh, one of the families that hired a substitute to uh, take their place during the Civil War. And this substitute, uh, Mr. Dixon, actually died uh, of disease during the Civil War. So this family had passed on the story that, you know, great-grandpa lived because somebody else took his place in the Civil War, and we were able to interview the family that had uh, that legacy of a substitute. But there are many, many more substitute stories that we are researching, so we hope to continue this discussion and be able to talk to you about uh, that. We had uh, efforts across the country, which uh, the Confiscation Act and other laws permitted the substitutes, so it wasn't anything under the table. Uh, the person uh, was paid $300 by the person who was seeking the substitute uh, upon uh, enlistment and, and uh, participation in the military. So it was not uh, totally an uncommon thing, it's just an undertold story. So we're trying to bring that portion out so that people know the stories of those who volunteered, those who helped other families uh, keep the farm by going in their place, and those who also worked to help make uh, citizens and access to citizenship in Minnesota. So the effort by the U.S. Uh, colored, the colored People's Convention was a statewide effort. So you can imagine in the 1860s doing a statewide petition drive, you had to go by horse, wagon, foot to cover the entire state. But there was no stone left unturned. Uh, people were organized, and as I said, by the third effort, <laughs> they were very, very uh, organized. So once they got the governor's ear and got the citizenship, uh, they didn't let go. Uh, black 
people stayed involved with politics uh, continuously. There was not a time where they did not feel that those political connections no longer needed to be uh, nurtured. So in the Longfellow neighborhood, we have something that's called the Hiawatha Golf Course. And I think many of you are aware of the various controversies and also aware that there have been African American families, both men and women, who fought for the right to uh, use a public golf course back in the 30s. And once they got the right to use the public golf course, they uh, golfed for that four or five hours, depending on how good or bad you were, without being able to use the toilet because the faci clubhouse facility was segregated. So they let the black players come to the golf course but said, you can't eat in the clubhouse and you can't use the toilet. So we have uh, talked to a number of black golfers whose fathers and grandfathers were golfing under those restrictions and about the coolers and the sandwiches and all the other makeshift things that they had to put together to be able to have a modicum of pleasure on the golf course and uh, stay regular. We had Joe Lewis play golf at the Hiawatha Golf Course. We had Tiger Woods come and select Hiawatha Golf Course so he could give a demonstration. And we had things called the Bronze Tournament and Upper Midwest Golfing Tournaments. So we've had a number of different events continuously in that Longfellow neighborhood at the Hiawatha Golf Course. And so uh, one of those families was, again, the uh, Sergeant Harper's family. One of his descendants, Harry Davis Sr., was a regular golfer at the golf course, as was another uh, mentee named Richard Green. And uh, Harry Davis was a long-term member of the school board, and Richard Green became the superintendent of schools. And then they selected a neighborhood to uh, try to integrate the schools. So Field and Hale were the two schools selected for that uh, integration. And again, back to that historic Longfellow area for that uh, first integration in the 1970s. So we've had a number of different events that touch the nation that emanate out of that uh, quadrant of the city, but we uh, need to lift it up more. We need to uh, fill in the blanks and we need to involve the descendants more so that they can have ownership and tell the stories of their families and where they fit in. We have also, with the pioneer families like Ralph and Emily Gray, there are many areas of their lives and contributions that we are seeking to bring to a higher level to the public, and we hope uh, if we have another opportunity to address you in the future, we'll be able to tell you our progress with uh, Ralph and Emily Gray and their descendants. So I want to leave time for questions, and so I'll stop here and see if there are any questions. Well, the, the military pay was $13 a month. So $300 was a lot of money at that time. And the, the substitutes that we're researching are the black substitutes and uh, the records of the historical society reflect 13, but we believe there are more. Thank you. Could I be eager one more question? And mm -hmm. that is, are you familiar with the Lee House on Columbus Avenue? Yes. Could you tell me the status of that? 
Well, as far as we know, the Lee House on Columbus Avenue is still on the National Register of Historic Places. In, in our, later in the film, which we didn't show in full length, but you can look at uh, online, we interviewed one of Lee's uh, descendants who became a firefighter in the first patch of firemen to integrate after the second effort to integrate the Minneapolis Fire Department. And so uh, Arthur Lee was his name over on Columbus Avenue who bought the house in the 1930s in a uh, restricted neighborhood from a man who had financial difficulty. And Arthur Lee had had uh, the uh, honor of serving in World War II and had the money and the means to buy the house. And then there were literally thousands of people from the neighborhood who came to protest uh, this uh, black man in the approximately 1931 buying because they had squeezed out the black people and had restrictive covenants and did not expect any uh, of the homeowners to sell to a black person. So the U.S. Postal Union, along with others, formed a human chain around Lee's house because Lee was a member, a postal uh, carrier. And so they formed a line of protection to protect Lee's home from these thousands of people. And a woman by the name of Lena Smith who uh, was an attorney, one of the first black women to graduate from William Mitchell College of Law, was the attorney who came to represent Mr. Lee and to be his Olivia Pope in times of crisis to say, talk to the media and say, we are not moving. We're not gonna be run out by a mob. And uh, Lena Smith, was also very active in later on over the years defending people in civil rights cases and also real estate cases. And she lived on 37th and 5th Avenue. So that whole South Side neighborhood was an incubator for people who were very uh, committed, very active, and also sought the skills and training to be able to fill those roles that the black community needed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other? Okay. I assume you've read uh, Into the Bright Sunshine by Samuel Friedman, the new book that came out about Hubert Humphrey and the convention in um, 48 in Philadelphia. And so that long discussion about the status of African Americans in Minnesota in the 20s and 30s and 40s, um, do you think that's fairly complete and accurate? Well, I think uh, Friedman did a lot of work. He talked to uh, Tracy Williams, uh, Cecil Newman's uh, great-granddaughter, and a number of other people to try to get research uh, for the book. And we had in the United States and in the black community in Minnesota, we had key people who were central to uh, politics. So they had latched on to Humphrey in the 40s, uh, helped him get elected mayor, became part of his kitchen cabinet, and uh, A.B. Cassius, Nellie Stone Johnson, Cecil Newman, and my parents were involved at a lower rank because they were younger and they were uh, coming in the 40s from the South. So they weren't part of the central brain trust, but they were close. So my mom would talk about meetings that Humphrey would have at Waverly, and this is later, but the black community had no intention of backing down or letting Humphrey uh, back down. So they went to that convention in 1948 with the Southerners saying, uh, we're gonna withdraw, and uh, saying, Truman, you're gonna lose. But the good part of that whole convention 
was that Truman also had a black kitchen cabinet, so he knew how that worked. And Humphrey's black kitchen cabinet wasn't going to back down. And even though the uh, Democrats, Dixiecrats, were going to walk, Humphrey still pushed for integration of the Democratic Party and gave that famous speech in 1948 saying we have to move into the sunshine of human rights. It's his legacy. It's his legacy. And so the people came back, and that was the whole political uh, brilliance of both the black people who were in Truman's cabinet and the black people who were in Humphrey's kitchen cabinet. Uh, giving the speech was not enough. Winning. So what they had to do was quietly go across the country